After 12 manic weeks of bluffing, backstabbing, superstar egos, and transatlantic rivalry, Live Aid Day finally dawned. Everyone was on tenterhooks. Television was still in the Stone Age, and no one had ever done anything like this before. 58 bands, live, over 16 hours, with a temperamental revolving stage and 13 satellites. Would it work? Would anyone watch? And more importantly, would the punters put their hands in their pockets? sleep. Paula had put towels under the sheet because I, I, I had that phenomenon of cold sweat. I was just pacing and I was on the phone quite a lot still and I was trying to put off leaving. That's the truth. That That's right this second what I remember. It's just suddenly a blast of that. I remember opening the curtains and seeing a sunny day and I think it was one of the few or maybe the only sunny day that summer. And I thought, wow, something's happening. The magnitude of the day ahead was just beginning to dawn on the reluctant BBC boys fronting the show. I don't really get to sleep, to be honest. Um, I can remember kind of getting up, certainly at about five o'clock, and going for a walk by the river. And at six o'clock, the phone went. It was Andy Kershaw, uh, my old mate, who lived around the corner. He said, hey, Mark, have you got your brown trousers on? <laughs> and I remember being absolutely sick with fear, waiting for the BBC car to come and pick me up. And I lived in Chiswick in those days. And the car had already picked up Mark Allen. And even Mark's uh, <laughs> relentless uh, joshing and wonderful sense of humor in the car up to Wembley couldn't really uh, make me lighten up. But nobody else wanted to miss out. Even Live Aid's toughest press critic, the NME, sent a solitary hack. Yeah, I remember getting the tube train up to North London, and of course all the carriages were packed with um, people going to live it, and it struck me this wasn't a typical concert-going audience of the kind that I was used to from the 70s and the 80s. This wasn't a rock audience as such, this really was Middle England. Shorts and t-shirt and big bags yeah, yeah. full of drinks yeah, and sandwiches, litres. just in case we died of starvation <laughs> in London. <laughs> yeah, definitely two litres of weak orange squash, I vividly we remember that, with a handle. <laughs> Everybody was nice. <laughs> Nobody was going to be horrible to each other. You could just feel that. Everybody was smiling. Hiya, hiya. You know, everybody was just terribly excited. At 10 o'clock, the dam burst. And Ali just went, run! <laughs> we all ran across Wembley Stadium. It was just, it was awesome, it was absolutely awesome just to get in there and see all the stage set up and just a fantastic feeling. While the fans staked out their turf, just across the river, a massive airlift was getting underway. Jason, is there any persons on board and you're fine? The stars were in the air and their pilot was TV presenter Noel Edmonds. There was no space to land helicopters at Wembley, and the nearest spot that we could find was the other side of the tube line where there is a cricket pitch. The first point of contact pointed out to us there was a very important cricket match on that day. 
And we said, well, it's Live Aid. The world is watching. This is the only place that we can land. They said, but it's a very important cricket match we've got. <laughs> this could only happen in this country. So all these guys in their whites, you know, sort of ready at the bat. And next thing you know, it was up with the stumps, this, in they ran, blah, blah, blah. Out came Bono in a car, Range Rover off, back in the stumps, where were we? You know, back on. I got there in a helicopter, yes, um, from my house in Windsor. Because of, uh, not being grand or anything like that, because I just thought the fucking traffic would be a nightmare. Elton was going through a particularly interesting period um, in the follicle department. And it was pointed out that when he arrived at Wembley, the rotors of the helicopter had to be stationary <laughs> for fear that the draft could cause the Elton rug to become detached. He was very worried about his wig. However, on the day, what he should have been concerned about was his garden. I wasn't too happy because we just planted some things at the garden and the, the helicopter um, took off and, and more or less destroyed everything that we'd done in that summer trying to plant the, the, the things that we did. And the words that came out of Elton's mouth were just, my fucking begonias, I've just had them done. Others were enjoying a different kind of trip. I remember circling over the place in a helicopter. At least I think I was in a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, before we went on, and uh, obviously before we went on. And it was just such an amazing sight. I shall never forget that over the stadium. It, it just looked so fantastic. <laughs> It's like looking down into a, a sea of mullets. I think I even had one myself back then. They were very popular. Uh, and that just, that crackle of an anticipation. At 10 minutes to 12, and the time is now 13 minutes to 12, on the two big screens to the side of the stage, the world. 72,000 people sweltered in the baking heat. I find it incredible that the, sort of, the mass of people probably feel that something should be done, yet their own governments just don't do anything. They do very little. You know, the very fact that it has to be done by people giving their own money is, is ridiculous. I mean, we've given enough money into government, why can't they spend some of our money giving it back? Perfectly honest, we were into the music scene. <laughs> and, um, OK, it was a good cause, but I don't think at that age we maybe should have been, but our first priority was having a good time in the music. Backstage, nobody seemed to know what was going on. There were a lot of people walking about in clipboard, with clipboards and, and headphones and, and looking as though they knew what they were doing. <laughs> Which, of course, in hindsight, I realised that nobody knew what was going on at all. Uh, and it was full of, full of pop stars sort of looking quite vacant. The words of wisdom, let it be. What time is it? It's Christmas time. There's no need to be afraid. At Christmas time. While the stars tuned up, Geldof was his usual manic self. When we got there, I, I saw him. He, he was uh, on a phone next to one of those huge trailers, and he was saying, Fuck off! No, stick it up your ass. And I thought, well, God, I wonder if it's the right time to say hello. So I, <laughs> I wandered up and I said, hi, Bobby. He went, oh, good, you're here. Hello, Pam, how you doing? Oh, good, I'm glad you're here, blah, blah, blah. And it's going great and tra-la-la. And I said, somebody on your, on your back there. He said, ach! <laughs> somebody wanted to put Santana on next. He said, the fucking crap. <laughs> <laughs> <I> said, <laughs> this guy from the from the Boomtown Rats is telling me that Santana are crap. I think not. Wrap your arms around the world yeah. at Christmas time. Ta With 
With all the chaos backstage, the production crew forgot all about the imminent arrival of the royal couple. It was a mad rush to hit the phones. You gotta come early. Why do I come early? I'm on at six o'clock, seven o'clock at night. Amazingly, everyone came. Rock stars don't get up, do they? But no, if you see the footage, everyone's there. And everyone was there to meet Britain's most glamorous royal. And she got to me and, and my managers said, uh, this is Nick Kershaw. And she said, I know who he is, which I was very pleased with. Yeah. The princess died, said to Bob, didn't realize he was so short. And he said, surely he's a fucking midget. She was completely flirtatious, actually. She was a real sort of, you know, and I'm sure she said something of sort of slightly naughty extract. I seem to remember it was something to do with underwear or suspenders or something a little fruity. All these grown pop stars being completely jelly at Princess Diana Tony, all going, oh, you know, like schoolboys. While stars were being smitten, Television producers were racing against time to write the biggest introduction in television history. With seconds to go, I got a, a little voice in my earpiece saying, um, the royal party are not going on stage, they're going straight to the royal box, so you will have to do the opening. Oh, will we? He dictated to me with my hands, you know, and I wrote out these words, it's 12 noon in London, 7 a.m. in Philadelphia. Um, read it to myself a couple of times quietly, gave a bit of voice lever on the microphone, and before you knew it, it was 30 seconds, good luck. And he started to read it, and he'd read the first two or three words when suddenly they switched the PA on in the stadium. It's 12 noon, and then it goes, it's 12 noon. It's 12 noon in London, 7 a.m. in Philadelphia. And around the world, it's time for Live Aid. And then there was this extraordinary moment where Richard and I just embraced each other and, f and cried. We were, we, were, we were both quite overcome. It was just kind of, <laughs> it started, we're all right. Geldof had chosen the opening act weeks earlier, but they weren't everyone's favorite vintage. Some chap says, who's opening the show? And uh, Bob went, well, it's obvious. Who's gonna open the show? It's status quo. Rocking all over the world. And I went, oh no, I'm not sure about that. Even in 1985, it seemed as if status quo had been around forever, doing exactly the same riff <laughs> over and over, wearing the same clothes. And he was behind me when the announcement was made that status quo were coming on first. And he just turned around and said, oh, fucking stand status quo. In all the years that we'd been together, even by then, by 85, um, you know, we weren't necessarily nervous before a gig, bit of nervous energy, but I was really cacking myself before we went out there, you know. Would you welcome status quo? Looking at the crowds just before they started the opening bars, you know, the hairs on the back of the neck were standing up. And I was standing there with Tony Hadley, who's about seven foot three, isn't it? And, um, and you could hear in your headphones, five, four, three, two, one. Down, 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 down. went up, everyone's clapping, arms above the head. I look behind me and there's Andy. 
you fucking hypocrite. No one wanted to accept me, but we thought status quo were quite cool when they played. Secretly, you wanted to hate yourself for thinking that, but they were great when they came on. And Tony Hadley, I just looked up at him, he looked down at me, and we both burst into tears. The ex-punk Bob Geldof, who'd once written a song knocking the British Empire, was now hobnobbing with his new best friend, the Prince. And he said, who threw these chips you were doing? And I, and I said, oh, that's uh, status quo, sir. And he said, you, who, who exactly are they? You know? and, and I said, um, well, you know, I said, I asked them particularly because they're um, almost a cartoon of rock and roll. He says, you extra bend, and he was sort of clapping arrhythmically and stuff like that. He would have enjoyed a sort of chamber orchestra type of setup, more than a sort of, um, you know, the cream of the world's glitterati, fritterati, and whatever. Um, she loved it. She just loved it. I'm sure she would have married Phil Collins if he'd asked her. <laughs> to open it, it, that doesn't bother us at all. Fantastic. Best spot. Mm. Sod clothes in it, can you imagine? Across the Atlantic, America was getting ready to join the fray. But one loose cannon threatened disaster. American concert promoter Bill Graham was an angry, difficult control freak. He'd been heading for a showdown with the TV producers. Now, with minutes to go, he tried to restrict their access. About a half hour prior to the show starting, Bill had uh, our TV badges pulled. Couldn't go to the stage. So all he had was distant cameras. So uh, I got my attorneys and said, I, I want him either removed off the premises or taken out of our um, operational uh, issues um, or we're, you know, we're yanking it. The police came in with Mike Mitchell. They were going to arrest Bill Graham for trespass. <laughs> because they wanted to get rid of him. And I called, I called Bob right away and I said, Bob, it's not gonna happen. We'll handle the situation, we'll deal with Bill. And we finally got everybody to leave, everybody calmed down. A deal was struck. The promoter was banished to the stage area, but he was still looking for trouble. We had not only been asked to build a, not only a small reproduction, but a 500-seat uh, Hard Rock Cafe backstage uh, next to the artist area. And uh, Mr. Graham came rolling in there a couple of hours before the whole concert. He had not been over there. Who in the fuck authorized this? That's what he said. <laughs> and uh, actually, it was him. <laughs> As the Wembley concert continued, behind the scenes, the money started to trickle in. 23,000 pounds in the first few minutes. Volunteers manned 300 BBC phone lines to take donations, but Geldof was still anxious. I thought that people wouldn't watch. I thought that people wouldn't give money. I thought that the political lobby, which so interested me that I could raise this day, would just be w wasted, so all that wasted. And here now is the band that's led by the man who was the spark, Bob Geldof and the Boomtown Rat. Geldof's own band hadn't had a hit in years. Would they get the money rolling in? I tried to talk Bob out of performing. I felt it was a bit strange. I don't actually know what he felt about it. I felt 
uncomfortable. But he wanted to do it. And indeed, you could, you could argue that had anybody else organised this, the Boomtown Rats would not have got a 15-minute slot at Live Aid. That's the point. They were very nervous and very self-conscious and probably felt a little bit rusty and, and out of their depth. But the fact was, everyone did want to see Bob Geldof. In fact, I, I would say on the day, he was as big as anyone else. People really wanted to see the man who'd made it all happen. His mind was not at that much, but once he went on stage, he was back in the band. And so for 10 or 15 minutes, he was back in the Boomtown Rats and he was playing the gig, and, and that was great. He stopped two thirds of the way through the song. The lesson today is how to die. We've been learning that the lesson today is how to die. So it's not normally a break in the song, but the crowd have gone mental. Bob keeps his hand up for what seemed forever. And suddenly, that line took a completely different meaning. Minutes later, it was the turn of Geldof's band aid partner Midgeur to face the crowds. His chart topping band Ultravox had been billed as one of the show's highlights. It was petrifying walking out there, but the roar, the crowd was just fantastic. It must be how a gladiator felt or, or how a football hero feels walking on to that thing, you know, to, to walk onto this massive roar of recognition. The rest of it just disappeared. I would argue the toss now that we weren't on stage for 18 minutes. You were no sooner on, you'd maybe started to break sweat if you were lucky, and then you were off. You were gone again. Ultravox should have played earlier, at 12.47, but after a last-minute change to the running order, they were swapped with the Boomtown Rats. This meant that by the time Midge and his boys came on, the Royal Party had left. As I walked backstage, all the paparazzi were there, and they said, well, how do you feel being shafted by Bob? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you were swapped round with the Boomtown Rats so that he could perform for the Royals. I said, nah. Yeah. The Prince and Princess of Wales had agreed to stay for a couple of hours. And so there was a bit of jockeying for position. And it was felt that it was right for Bob to, if he was going to perform, to perform within that period in front of them. Someone who was organising the uh, the technical side of things, came up to me and said, oh, there's a problem, Adamant's equipment, um, do you mind if the rats go on before you? And I said, no, don't care, it doesn't matter. It was then quite obvious that, you know, those four bands were, were, were playing in front of the royal family. Midge is very keen on the royal family, was keen to play in front of them. Um, but it was decided it wasn't to be, and he was very, very upset about it. But there you go, you know. 
Yeah, it's just the way it is, isn't it? That's the comment. It actually wasn't my decision. Probably Bob's decision, really, to decide that he wanted to be on at that point. Oh, bastard. <laughs> it probably was Bob, yeah. Well, I thought I, 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 I have, um, I've given him the benefit of the doubt and said, well, you know, I'm sure he knows nothing about it, and it was just a, a swap round. I didn't even know we'd been swapped, you know, on the day. I certainly wouldn't have requested that. I couldn't give a toss, just so long as we were on, you know. I, I insisted upon that. That's for bloody sure, you know. <laughs> Whoever gave the go-ahead for the swap, Midgeo felt slighted. But I think the thing that hurt most was, as a Band-Aid trustee, I was lied to. And it, it was unnecessary. It didn't have to happen. You know. The show had to go on. Some of the outfits were a bit over the top. Spandau Ballet looked like they'd borrowed their mum's blouses to play to one and a half billion people. All right, world. Hey. My nerves started to go. It was knowing that when you walked on stage, you were walking out in front of millions of people worldwide who would be watching and would always say, I remember your show, it was awful. And you couldn't get it wrong. Well, that we had played at Wembley Stadium, and for me, it was like being in the FA Cup final. It was a dream come true, to be honest. And I remember going around in this big leather coat on, sweats coming down, you know, and the swung round. And the mics just come flying out my hand. And I was like, oh no. I tried to be cool and, ha-ha, <laughs> hey, <laughs> could have had a gun, I would have shot myself at that moment. Thank you! But there was no respite for the BBC team, marooned in the Wembley commentary box. Their lack of rehearsal was...